Hi, and welcome to chapter 14. Uh, in this chapter, your author is uh, kind of splitting the four Ps. For those of you who remember them from Business 10, uh, in the four functions of management, uh, marketing, or uh, also known the marketing mix. Uh, what he does here is uh, he's taking the chapter, and if you look at the title, Competing in Marketing and Supply Chain Management, for those of you who remember the four Ps, you'll see that three belong in one place and one is kind of separate, right? So uh, the supply chain management obviously is place of distribution, right? Uh, product promotion and price uh, is going to be embedded within the first part marketing. So just want to kind of give you a heads up. And why, why did he do that? Well, he did this because um, everything in global business uh, really lives or die on uh, supply chain management. And so that, that's uh, such a critical aspect of uh, trade that, of course, it, it has its own emphasis. All right, let's uh, go with the learning outcomes to get going. Uh, we'll look at the three of the four P's in marketing. Uh, and then we'll look at the fourth P and how it's evolved to be labeled supply chain management. Uh, we'll look at the triple A's, agility, adaptability, and alignment in supply chain management how institution and resources affect marketing and supply chain management, and then the uh, implications for action. Uh, your author has a really cool um, case study here on page 221. Uh, I, want, I want to make sure you read it. In fact, you should read it before the next slide. That way you'll appreciate the next slide more. So if you haven't read it, do it now. It's the uh, opening case, Marketing AFLAC in the US and Japan read it and then watch the next slide all right hopefully you have read now the the uh, opening case i want to show you the very first aflac uh, ad in the united states so that you can see uh, and of course there's there's an obvious reason as to why this ad takes place in a park now that you've read the case it probably makes a lot of sense so um, go ahead and watch this one first Well, when I got hurt in this work, glad I had supplemental insurance. Supplemental insurance? What's that? Aflac. Well, even best insurance doesn't give you cash to cover things like lost pay, other expenses. This does. What does? Aflac. You should ask about it at work. Eh? Really? And what's it called? Aflac! Uh, Aflac. Without it, no insurance is complete. Aflac! So now that you saw this, uh, you understand that, of course, um, that didn't work out too well in Japan without adaptation. And so now here's the Japanese clip uh, introducing Aflac uh, with the cat, which is, uh, as you read, uh, that uh, very important symbol in Japan. Not quite the same vibe, but uh, this is, I mean, as you read, uh, of course, now you understand why it worked in both markets and how, uh, when you look at uh, adaptation, uh, obviously uh, this is a case for adaptation. All right, let's move along to uh, our first slide here on marketing. Uh, marketing efforts to create, develop, and defend markets that satisfy the needs and wants of individual and business customers. So you'll see that, of course, the definition here uh, is modified for, for the context of global business. Uh, the supply chain is the flow of product services, finances, and information. It passes through a set of identities from a source to the customer. And as we know, and we've talked about before, and I know for those of you who've taken other classes with me, uh, we talk about the significance of supply chain management and supply chain here in the Inland Empire. 
where, uh, again, I know you, you've heard me say this before, but one out of every four jobs in the Inland Empire is tied to logistics, uh, warehousing, distribution, uh, supply chain activities. Uh, so very, very important for us here in the Inland Empire. Uh, and uh, the four P's, uh, pretty straight, oops, pretty straightforward here. Uh, so remember that uh, the four P's were, were created as what was called the marketing mix. And it's, it's called the marketing mix because to explain marketing and to understand marketing, you would have to treat it like a recipe. And if a recipe calls for four ingredients to make whatever it is you're making, then you can't have three, you can't have two, you need all four. And so it's called the marketing mix for that specific reason. Um, and uh, the, you know, the product is uh, the first one here listed, uh, obviously refers to the offering that the customer purchases. And so it could be a, a tangible, it could be intangible. Uh, in the context of this class, what you wanna make sure you understand when you look at product is again, kind of going back to the example even of uh, of, uh, of just the ad for Aflac, uh, standardization versus localization. To what extent do you want to standardize the product? Ideally, you would want one size fits all because you could reach scale, right? Uh, remember economies of scale or scalability. Every time your scale increases, your per unit cost goes down. Per unit cost goes down, profit goes up. Uh, you can also lower your your price, uh, your sales price as per unit cost going down and become more competitive and increase your market share, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole reason for us to want to make sure that um, sales go up. And you know, in this particular case, you want to standardize. Remember all you know, from your Business 10 class, uh, the, uh, the old Henry Ford quote, uh, where he said, you can have a Ford in any color as long as it's black. Uh, and so again, that's the case for uh, you know standardization. What we understand, of course, is that's not gonna work. Uh, in fact, speaking of Ford, Ford tried to have a global car and that really backfired royally. Uh, you got you gotta modify. There's there's efforts that you have to make to to localize the product. Uh, the case in point you'll see in the next slide here, price. Uh, I have some sobering examples of price for you coming up. Uh, promotion, uh, so the, the, again, the first three here are going to be what we'll cover now, uh, kind of as the first part of the chapter. And then the second part of the chapter will be dedicated entirely to place, right? So for product, uh, think about McDonald's. Uh, if For those of you who've traveled outside the US, you already know that uh, if you've ever visited a, a McDonald's outside the U.S., you, you've probably seen some differences. But, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing in McDonald's is kind of fun to use because you think of it as a very standardized product. But, you know, of course, in, in many countries, uh, you know, the book talks about uh, Germany, but also in, in many European countries and Korea and other countries, uh, they serve beer. And, of course, they're going to adapt the menu. Uh, this is an ad uh, from Spain uh, you know, showing you what the burger looks like, but also, of course, with a bottle of wine, a nice Malbec. And so, uh, you know, again, just uh, the product offering that customer purchase, and the question is about standardization versus localization, and how MNEs need to decide whether to market global brands or local brands in their portfolio. Remember, adapt or die. That was the theme of your Business 10 class, for those of you who took it with me. The entire book is dedicated to adapt or die. Adapt. Uh, product. Uh, so then now we're, we're looking at a market and you want to segment the market. You need to identify segments of consumers who differ from others in how they buy. And so here uh, in the context of this class and in the context of this uh, segmentation effort, you can look at um, one globally useful way of segmentation is to divide consumers in four categories. So you got the global citizens. So these are uh, your consumers who are in favor of buying global brands that signal prestige and cachet. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that this pandemic has been catastrophic, uh, you know, in, in so many uh, big cities in the U.S., you know, think New York and L.A., is that a lot, you know, when you think about Beverly Hills, Rodeo Drive, when you think about Fifth Avenue, 
uh, you know, in, in New York and all that, a big percentage of sales goes to uh, uh, foreign tourists. Uh, many, many Chinese tourists are spending a lot of money on uh, these exclusive brands, right? And, and that, when they go back to China, uh, signifies prestige. So they're, they're true global citizens. And then you have the, the global dreamers who may not be able to afford but admire the global brand. So these two, they're sold, right? They're bought in uh, to the idea of buying these foreign goods. And then we're getting into the anti-globals who are skeptical about whether global brands deliver higher quality goods, right? Uh, and so you, it's going to take more convincing to get them. And sometimes a multinational will do it the easy way, which is to buy the local brand, right, whenever possible. And of course, you would keep it with the local name, etc. Uh, and then the global agnostics are uh, those that are most likely to lead anti-globalization demonstration, uh, smashing McDonald's windows, uh, pretty much not going to happen. Um, always kind of ironic, though how um, you know they organize their meetings and rendezvous uh, as to where they're going to meet to break windows using their very American iPhones or American products, wearing Levi's, etc. So anyway, I added that little bit uh, because uh, whenever I see those footage, it's, uh, it's always interesting to see how many American products uh, they're wearing. Could be Nike shoes or Converse, etc. You got to look cool. Uh, let's see. Um, Let's then uh, go into the next level, which is going to be price. And so, of course, price is critical when you think about price. Um, think about what you buy and uh, think about, in fact, uh, you know, in my in my business 10 class, when we get into the marketing chapter, I was like, I was like to ask how many of you were accepted to a directly to a four year school fresh out of high school, but chose to go to a community college. And when asked as to why you made the decision, most students, many, but most students uh, always, of course, comment on price, right? And so uh, price is, is, is a very important component uh, in so many decisions that we make. Um, and so here you look at the expenditure that customers are willing to pay for a product. Um, you know, I obviously added this uh, little example here because I thought you would appreciate and could relate to it. This is old, this is from 2003, but the, the, the practice still exists. So when you think about how much you're paying for a textbook, right? And here, uh, you know, I've used Sandgage for letterpress, uh, and I really love this author, Peng, which is what I've used, you know, I've used this book for many years. Uh, and, and, you know, this book is affordable, uh, relatively speaking, especially for the quality and content that it delivers. Uh, there are other uh, great, global business textbooks that are cost a couple hundred bucks. And so when you think about, as a professor, my decision to choose a book for you, uh, my number one consideration is actually price. Uh, because even if content is not quite what I want, I know I can always supplement. Uh, but what, what I've discovered, having taught for now, what, 25 years, is the, the really, um, you know, again, it's, you know, it's capitalism, isn't it? Uh, but in terms of ethics, I'm not sure what it speaks of uh, and how uh, publishers will publish the same book uh, in the United States as they do in Europe and Asia, in English, by the way, often, uh, with a, you know, sometimes half the price. So this is a, this is a story here from 03 of students uh, from the New York Times finding $100 test textbooks cost 50 bucks uh, overseas, right? Uh, and, and in England, by the way, but it doesn't, you know, even outside of England. And so why is that? And I remember when, when, I, when I discovered that, you know, several years ago, I asked a couple of uh, people who worked in the industry and, you know, the answer they had was what the market will bear. That was it, it's Econ 101. Uh, publishers charge what the market will bear, which basically means that uh, if students are going to be forced to spend 200 bucks for a book because that's what the professor wants them to buy and they need the class to get to the next level, then they're going to have to find a way to spend 200 bucks on the book. And so that those days are you know coming to an end. Um, now there's a there's a different there's a movement for zero cost, which my business 10 class has zero cost textbooks. 
eventually one day there'll be a zero cost textbook maybe for global and maybe this author will be part of the movement I hope uh, but until then I, I know that uh, you'll have to pay uh, so any, anyway think about this way if that textbook cost a hundred bucks in the US as, as the story goes here uh, do you really think that the publisher is losing money selling a textbook in England for 50 bucks of course not and so we're talking about uh, you know pricing strategies leading to different profit margins uh, anyway that's thought I'd share that that one that of course you you can relate and applies to you uh, directly uh, the consumers are price sensitive but in this case uh, uh, you could say that the price is uh, often uh, you know the lacks elasticity for those of you who remember uh, you know elasticity from your econ class um, it's that some things are more elastic than not uh, if you are diabetic uh, and require insulin and the price of insulin doubles, you're still going to buy it. You have no choice, right? And so we could say that insulin is not an elastic good. It doesn't have uh, price elasticity. It is inelastic. On the other hand, think about wants. You know, if uh, you, I don't know, soda, and soda goes, you know, or people who, you know, smoke, uh, or although maybe smoking is not a good example, uh, because maybe that will, you know, the addiction will call, cause in, inelasticity. Uh, but anyway, uh, things that you will not buy because uh, price, there's a, there's a cap to the price. We saw that with fuel, with gasoline. Uh, several years back when, uh, you know, uh, a barrel of oil went up to about 160 bucks, uh, all of a sudden, people found other ways. They were carpooling. They were doing things. And so it showed that even gasoline has a peak when it comes to uh, elasticity. Uh, the picture that you see at the bottom of the screen here uh, for these two textbooks is uh, the, it's the same exact textbook. It's a psychology textbook. Uh, uh, but what's interesting is uh, that that ISC stands for International Students Edition. Uh, and sometimes they'll have a big thing in the front page that says like not for sale in the US or Canada. And so, but same book, identical, just different cover. Uh, so the practice I understand is still out there. All right, so that's for price. Now let's get into uh, the wonderful world of promotion. Uh, many, many students um, are, are interested in marketing because they like advertising and advertising falls under that P of promotion. So let's, let's get to uh, promotion. Uh, in this particular case, um, the example that you have from your author is a, is a fun one. It's the Coca-Cola bear. Uh, let, let's, talk, let's first talk about the definition. Uh, promotion is communication that marketers, are, ma marketers insert into the marketplace. Again, for those of you who already took the marketing class or intro to business, I know the definitions are different because these, these are within the realm of um, uh, you know, international uh, business. Uh, so marketers may choose to standardize or localize promotional effort and enhance or downplay country of origin effect. Uh, you know, in some cases, American brands, you know, think about Harley Davidson. Anybody outside the U.S. who's going to buy a Harley are not just buying a Harley because they want a loud uh, motorcycle. They're buying a Harley because it's very much uh, you know, an American product that, you know, it's, it's uh, a muscular, loud, in your face, very American, you know, part of the American culture. And so that's part of the sales strategy for Harley. You have that product comes with the American cachet to it. And so you enhance it, right? But in some cases, you uh, may have to downplay it. Maybe uh, the country might think that uh, coming from the U.S., the product, the quality might be inferior or not looked at as positively, depending on which country you're talking about. So this is the this is the ad that's uh, that's that's referred to. Let's check this out. So Coca-Cola had these, uh, you know, very popular, very successful uh, ads uh, with the bear, the polar bear as a campaign. 
Uh, and of course, what the bear signifies is, you know, Arctic region, very cold, etc. So a cold, refreshing Coca-Cola. Um, the problem is that outside uh, in, of the West, um, it didn't resonate. People were confused. Why is there a polar bear here? It makes no sense. Uh, and so around the same time, Coca-Cola had to kind of pivot and find another way to convey uh, cold, to convey what they still wanted the meaning to be conveyed, but the polar bear was lost on the audience, so they had to find another way to get that message across. And so th this first one here, this is an ad that you didn't see in the U.S., um, but this is a, a campaign that was extremely popular outside the U.S. in many countries, in, in Africa, uh, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and so here's one from Thailand. And then uh, let's look at one uh, from uh, that was aired in many uh, different African countries. All right, so um, I, you know, again, there's many, many, many more. If you want to research them, just put the B R R R in uh, in your search engine for Coca-Cola, and you'll see these ads from other, you know, different campaigns uh, in South Af South Africa. Uh, I know that uh, Nigeria also had its own campaign for a while, and that's just for Africa. The different campaigns there, uh, but uh, no polar bear, obviously, but that around the same time. Uh, to convey, you know, uh, cold, refreshing, whatever. All right, so that's for that's for that. Um, let's move uh, on here right. to um, some blunders in international marketing. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, again, this one here was a a, a doll that said uh, people thought they heard "kill mommy" uh, because I guess they didn't uh, speak uh, Spanish. Uh, made in Hong Kong, and the and they were initially uh, designed for. Uh, Latin American market, uh, Spanish speaking markets, uh, in, and the, the doll was really saying "quiero mami," uh, and but I guess uh, people thought that, you know, "kill mami." Probably not a great gift uh, to give to someone, uh, uh, unless maybe a gag gift. Uh, anyway, um, AT and T uh, in uh, Thailand uh, to sell phone equipment, uh, decide, despite great technology, rejected because Thailand required ten year warranty, and uh, AT and T only offered. Uh, five year. Uh, Japan's Olympia tried to market a photocopier in Latin America called uh, Roto, uh, which of course means broken in Spanish. Um, Chinese exporters, uh, white elephant brand battery. Uh, my favorite is the Maxi Puke. Uh, 
uh, right, uh, in, 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 which were uh, poker cards. I'd love to get my hands on some of those. Uh, but so anyway, uh, what you learn uh, in, uh, in Global 2 is this concept of back translation. I think we've talked about it before. It, it, what you do is, is whatever campaign you have uh, domestically, if you are thinking about exporting this campaign, you need to have someone from uh, the other office, the, 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 the uh, division where you're going to be doing this, uh, look and review your ad and then translate it back to them in English. And that you might find that there's something you had not considered. Uh, it could be colloquialism. It could be something else. So back translation is 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 really uh, absolutely required. And it's amazing that some of these companies still make mistakes uh, even today, even recently, uh, because they're not doing that. All right, place. Let's go to uh, uh, place, which is again, like I told you, uh, this is the biggie now. This is we're getting to part two of the chapter location where products and services are provided, uh, referred to as the distribution uh, channel. Uh, and the distribution channel is a set of uh, firms facilitating the movement of goods from producers to consumers. Um, let me share something with you uh, here uh, from uh, the uh, Inland Empire uh, uh, chief economist. So this is uh, johnhusing.com. Uh, John Husing is a chief economist for the Inland Empire. Um, and if you click on QER here, you'll get the latest economic report. Uh, and I know there with me, uh, but this, there's a reason for me to share this with you. Um, and so uh, what, what I want to show, it's got a lot of data about sales. In fact, I, was, I found it fascinating that uh, to, to see which which areas the sales have gone up uh, the most in in, uh, in in real estate for existing homes etc uh, and and so uh, anyway that's not why I'm showing you this but just if you wanted to peruse this thing with your family there's lots of interesting data um, let's see why am I showing you this this is it right here if you look at growth in the Inland Empire going from 2011 uh, to 2020 estimate uh, there are two growth areas. And if you look at the number one uh, area of growth, it's logistics. Remember what I was telling you earlier, one of every four jobs. Federal and states, another one. Uh, and of course, restaurants have been completely decimated by this COVID thing, retail, etc. So, you know, and look at the numbers, 33,700. These are net numbers. Um, and so, you know, this is just to kind of show you uh, the significance of, in this particular case, logistics. Uh, while I'm at it, I might as well show you this. Highest share associates of our higher degrees. Uh, when you look at, uh, at the Inland Empire, we, we got room for improvement. Uh, you know, LA is at 40% of LA has um, uh, a uh, associates or higher as a degree. And so think about what that means. LA County, 60% of the population does not have a college degree. Uh, Rancho, we're at 46%. Uh, so there, you know, you're in the right place at the right time. You know, keep your education moving, uh, get get it done, and and get a degree that pays. Uh, look at that, Samuel Mountains is where people have been. You know, the most activity in real estate has been uh, Samuel Mountains with 87% increase. Everybody's getting out of the city during COVID, and they're buying mountains in the in the hills, uh, in uh, you know, Wrightwood. Uh, all right, so. Uh, that's my little way of, again, letting you know that this boring little chapter on supply chain, which a lot of times people think like, oh, distribution, trucks, I get it, I get it. Uh, because we live in the Inland Empire, this is a critical chapter for you. Uh, somehow you're tied to that economy somehow. And as I said at the very beginning of this class, uh, global business, you know, without global business, there is no economy in the Inland Empire. Just remember that. Without trade, if you take away trade, you take away a quarter of everything in the inland economy, inland empire economy, which dominoes into everything else, right? If we have warehouses, if we have trucks, it's not just because of trade, it's because of trade with Asia, namely with China. And by the way, it's not exports, it's imports. 
all these jobs we have in the Inland Empire is because Americans are hungry for Chinese goods because of costs. And so, and because of sophistication, not just cost, uh, people think cheap stuff from China. Just remember your, your, your favorite items, your smartphones are most likely made in China. All right. Uh, this is a cool scene. I love this scene. It's from uh, Cast Away. It's the beginning of the movie. And it's kind of a glimpse as to uh, logistics turbo mode. Just watch. That means we've got three hours and four minutes before the end of today's package sort. That's how long we have. That's how much time we have before this pulsating, accursed, relentless taskmaster tries to put us out of business. Hey, Nikolai, hey, Nikolai, good to see you. How are you, kid? Look what you did. You just delivered your very first FedEx package. That deserves something special, like a Snickers bar and a CD player. And something to listen to, a CD. There, Elvis Presley. 50 million fans, can't be wrong. You all recognize this, don't you? I took the liberty of sending this to myself. I fed Exit it before I left Memphis. You're probably wondering what could be What could it possibly be? Is it architectural plans? Maybe technical drawings? Is this a new wallpaper for the, for the bathroom? It is a clock, which I started at absolute zero and is now at 87 hours, 22 minutes and 17 seconds. From Memphis, America to Nikolai in Russia, 87 hours. 87 hours is a shameful outrage. This is just an egg timer. What if it had been something else, like your paycheck, or fresh boysenberries, or adoption papers? 87 hours is an eternity. The cosmos was created in less time. Wars have been fought, and nations toppled in 87 hours. Fortunes made and squandered. What? All right. Um, I want to show you one more thing since we're talking about this. I, I again love that movie i'm just uh just uh and this is such a great opening if you haven't seen it i think it might actually uh, make you feel better about uh this whole COVID thing uh you think you have it bad just watch this movie and it'll make you rethink uh how lucky we are uh and um and let me show you one more thing um uh, even the book talks about fedex and there's always a lot um there's a you know in fact on page 226 uh, there's the case here for fedex etc um, I, I want to just kind of bring something to your attention. So this is an old article. It's from 2014. Uh, but still, my understanding is that uh, this is the, the, real, the real global leader. Um, it, the brands we're most familiar in the U.S. are FedEx uh, and uh, DHL. Uh, but uh, the real, I'm sorry, FedEx and UPS. But the real global leader is this company, uh, DHL, right? Uh, so, I mean, look at this for the market share. Again, I know this is outdated. Uh, the global logistics market has reached $4 trillion in 2013. Today, it's more than doubled. Uh, and that's 10% of the global GDP. Um, in terms of time-definite international shipping, uh, DHL is the global leader in logistics uh, with, uh, you know, about a third, really, of the market share. My understanding is still there. And if you look at regions in the Americas, yes, FedEx is number one, UPS is number two, and DHL is number three. This is why we're so familiar with FedEx and UPS. What's fascinating, and then DHL is only 16% in, Amer in the Americas. Uh, but when you look at um, Middle East and Africa, look at DHL, boom, half. Uh, Europe, almost half. Uh, Asia Pacific, almost half. Globally, there it is. Uh, so FedEx is still trailing. It's been trying, but um, uh, 
uh, DHL has been really uh, entrenched and it was um, one of the first to really figure out the last mile um, and the book talks about what that is the last mile all right so now the supply chain management you have your supply network that feeds into producer manufacturer that feeds into the distribution network that leads to your customer it could be retail or it could be uh, wholesale I mean, you know, uh, for, for business purposes. Uh, let's get into the AAA in supply chain management. That's on page 26. First A is agility. Uh, ability to react quickly to unexpected shifts in supply and demand. Then you have adaptability, uh, ability to change supply chain configuration in response to long-term changes in environment and technology. Enhancing adaptability involves making a series of make or buy decision. Uh, we talked about make or buy decision before, but here it is again, decision on whether to produce in-house or the outcome. Um, and if you think about, you know, this pandemic has been, you know, the book talks about these other things that have happened in the past. Uh, you know, uh, swine flu, all that stuff, natural disasters, uh, earthquakes, all that. Uh, you know, we have the mother of all interruptions here uh, with the COVID pandemic. And it's been fascinating to see uh, what companies have been able to maintain uh, their network. I mean, you know, who would have thought, who would have thought that in this century, Americans would actually run out of toilet paper? Think about that for a second. No matter what the demand is, uh, that, you know, people are, you know, shelves went empty, right? And so that speaks volume of, uh, again, agility and adaptability. And uh, my understanding is we're still uh, having issues now. We have a second wave of shortage uh, for you know, household cleaning supplies and toilet paper, etc. Uh, and so moving along here uh, with the uh, uh, AAAs uh, requires monitoring and understanding of geopolitical, social, and technological trends. And then you have alignment alignment of interests in various players. Alignment's a big deal. Um, players should effectively coordinate to achieve desirable outcomes. So here's a little case in point from your author, and I decided to kind of expand on it. Uh, he reminds us that 70% of Boeing Dreamliner's component are, is outsourced, right? So again, it's just astounding, right? 30% of a Boeing is made by Boeing. Think about it that way and 70% is outsourced. And then in terms of country of origin, here's a clip here for the Dreamliner showing you uh, what countries are, are involved. It's a true marvel of globalization, this thing. And by the way, uh, the same applies to Airbus. Uh, the key element here is power and trust. I mean, if you don't, if you don't give uh, power and trust to your uh, partners, uh, this is not gonna work out. Uh, powerful players facilitate legitimacy and efficiency of the whole supply chain. Uh, there is a fantastic example from your author on page 227 of the fashion house Zara, uh, Z-A-R-A. -A. Um, I, I, I really uh, hope that you read it. It's about fast fashion, but it's more important than fast fashion. Uh, you know, what, what's not featured in this uh, story here on 227 is that the CEO of Zara, of the, you know, the parent company of Zara, uh, was uh, indie text was uh, uh, one time the uh, wealthiest person in the world. I, I think I want to say about six years ago, uh, wealthier than Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, all these guys. And this is a guy who is not in um, high tech or, you know, he's, he's, he's this guy who founded this empire that has to do with fashion. But what he did is astounding. And the reason Zara is where it is today, where competitors can't even come close with uh, what it's able to deliver uh, is entirely because of its supply chain management. Um, so I hope you read it. It's fascinating. Uh, if, if I find it fascinating and I'm not a big fan and I don't really care about the fashion industry, you, you hopefully will find it amazing, especially if you like fashion. Um, let's see. AAA is moving on. So again, we're still uh, covering the same here. We're covering alignment. Uh, uh, trust stems from perceived fairness and justice. Uh, neutral intermediaries can effectively align the interest of the supply chain. So you get these third-party logistics that provide logistics and other support services 
Um, this is true of many industries. Uh, formal rules exist. Uh, now we're getting into the second part here. We're in page uh, 229. And we're going to our old friend, right? We're, we're looking at the institution-based view and resource-based view. So that's where we're, we're finishing up here. Like this is the third part of the chapter. So formal rules that exist within an industry have a huge impact. Uh, there are restrictions such as taboos in advertising, equity, limiting uh, retail with the three uh, uh, party uh, leader, uh, sectors. Uh, the informal rules, differences in cultures, language, norms need to be considered. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the case here that your author makes, uh, that there again, this a debate on page 230 with IKEA uh, marketing in Saudi Arabia. And uh, IKEA made a controversial move of excluding women from its catalogs and airbrushing them out. Uh, and it did it to respect the market, the local market. You know, we're going back to adaptation. But the shareholders, uh, you know, in, in Sweden, uh, we're very upset that it did that. So who do you please? Do you please the people in the market you're operating and you're adapting? Or do you please the people back home uh, who are you know upset that you've airbrushed women out of the catalogs so that you could adapt to the market? It's a great opener. Uh, let's see. So informal rules. Uh, again, I just covered that. Uh, the advertising in online media adds value. Uh, again, the VRIO, remember that. Uh, the, for our rarity in marketing and supply chain activities need to be assessed. Here, I know we talked about it before, but I always go back to Michael Dell and Dell. Dell is just such an outlier. It's such an exception. It's phenomenal. I know when you think of Dell, you, do not get, you don't get excited. We get excited over Apple. Uh, but what Dell has done, uh, it's kept things in-house. Dell makes its own computer still. It's phenomenal. It's profitable and is breaking rules by making its own computers. Uh, whereas, you know, Apple is outsourcing to Foxconn, right? So Foxconn, big manufacturer in China, I think we talked about them. Uh, the second one is inimitability, right? Western multinational enterprises are careful while outsourcing processes and strengthening customer loyalty. You know, Foxconn is a giant. It's almost impossible for, you know, when you think about the companies that manufacture at Foxconn, uh, my kids' PS4, uh, a lot of the video games, uh, of course, Apple products. Uh, and then the organization itself, uh, in this particular case, I, you know, I talked about rarity, but even go back to organization when it comes uh, to the um, uh, 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 example of Dell, right? Marketing and sales function should work together to accomplish organizational objectives. This is a big deal uh, because marketing and sales function uh, in, in different companies, and in fact, this is highlighted here with your author, um, ve very often they're, they're different parts of the organization and they're almost combative. So you have the marketing department, you know, composed of people who are, you know, more, you know, the more educated, studied marketing, market research, etc. Sales, not always. Sales, sometimes people work their way up and you're a good salesperson. You don't maybe have the same. So the, the author talks about salespeople being more street smarts, right? And so what happens is that uh, if the organization is not careful and these two departments are separate and operate in silos, they start to blame each other for low sales, right? Uh, the sales team will say that the marketing department is not doing a good job marketing the product. That's why the sales are bad. And of course, the marketing department will say, well, these salespeople suck. And so uh, the example given by your author here is with IBM, uh, where what they did is they merged the two teams as one division called the channel enablement, and, uh, and they work in concert, right? And so that's hard to imitate now. Uh, companies that are not doing that are finding that uh, they they're, they're have that challenge. So there we go. So that's, that's what that looks like. We just covered everything here uh, in terms of that affecting your marketing and supply chain management. What's the implication for action? First, know the formals and informal rules of the game on marketing and supply chain management inside out. There are lots and lots of examples that the author gave you, you know, gave us here. Some really cool examples. Uh, I can't believe I said cool examples referring to 7-Eleven. But yes, some really interesting and cool examples about, uh, you know, 7-Eleven in Japan and how insane 
uh, it is, uh, you know, and, and, and the stakes are really, really high if you're operating in uh, logistics in Japan and to see what the requirements are for 7-Eleven in terms of delivering stuff on time uh, compared to the U.S. Uh, in marketing, uh, focus on product, price, promotion, and place, uh, four Ps, and, and do it all to avoid blunders. Uh, don't be too confident. Don't be too cocky. Make sure that you consider the local market. Again, we learned this from the IKEA example. Also, be mindful of not offending your home base. In supply chain management, focus on agility, adaptability, and alignment, the triple A's. And that's it for that chapter. By the way, there's a really cool closing case uh, from your author of, uh, you know, this uh, 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 number one is an uh, online shop number one in China and how the company is now, uh, got, you know, gotten so big uh, that it got the, uh, you know, in fact, Walmart bought a big chunk of it uh, and then ended up, uh, uh, you know, uh, selling it to another, uh, uh, to the second largest uh, company uh, in distribution in, in China, which is JD.com, uh, right behind Alibaba. Um, very, very interesting case. Uh, all right. Uh, by the way, why is it an interesting case? Because in this particular case, the founder of the company is uh, 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 someone who uh, had, uh, who was in the U.S. in Texas, uh, working for logistics and distribution uh, for uh, an American company, and then was able to kind of translate that in China. Very interesting case. All right, folks, uh, same as always, make sure you get all your key terms out of the way. We covered everything, uh, your summaries, make sure you get them out of the way. And that is going to conclude this chapter. See you next time.